John chapter 3, take your Bibles and turn there if you would. John chapter 3. And we are in the core of the, of the gospel and what it's about. Um, and this, this really is the heart. It is the center. It is the, the biggest, probably the most important doctrine that you'll, if, that you'll ever understand. If there are things in the Bible that you don't understand, join the church because we're full of people who do not know things that are in the Bible. But this one thing, the theme of the watchman last week, this week, next week, is the sacrifice of the Catholic mass versus the gospel. One billion people, more than one billion people in this world are totally and completely lost when they don't have to be. They attend a church, but that church has convinced them of the wrong gospel. And to try, I've witnessed to Roman Catholics before, and I mean standing on their doorstep trying to convince them. And most of them, are, they're just like anybody else. They just won't hear. Some do. There's even been priests and nuns that have been saved out of the Catholic Church. Um, there is a testimony, if you want to listen. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. I haven't listened to it in several years. But of a Catholic nun, I've got to try to remember her name. Yeah, Sister Charlotte. And her literal escape out of a convent. Life and death escape out of a convent. And she went around the country telling her story of what really goes on in the convent. What really goes on in there. And she's gone. She's missing. Don't know, don't know what happened to her. Um, so that, that organization has a lot of power in this world. And if you don't think they do, one of their chief cardinals, a cardinal by the name of George Pell of Australia, was sentenced, was found guilty by a jury and sentenced on child molestation cases that happened inside the church. He did it in the church to two boys. Sentenced, convicted, was in jail. And the Australian Supreme Court said he didn't do it. And they sent him loose, cut him loose. That's power. That's power. None of us have that kind of power. Okay? So that organization has a lot of power. They can be very dangerous. So always pray for us at our ministry, especially when I start dealing with what basically is uh, the core of their belief, and that is the Eucharist. If you don't eat the Eucharist, you cannot go to heaven. And... Um, to me, it just denies what John 3 says. John chapter 3, verse 10. Let's read this and we'll go to prayer. Jesus, he's, remember, he's with Nicodemus, who is already religious. He is a Jewish uh, man. He's one of the elders of the 70 of Israel. And he's a good man. I perceive that he's a good guy. But he's not saved. He's lost. And he comes to Jesus wanting to know this. And Jesus is going to answer it. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what is he referring to there? We'll talk about that. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Let's, and think about what he said. Did he say that the world through the church might be saved? The world through the Pope might be saved? The world through the priest or the sacraments or the, um, the, the 
Penance, where you go repent sins. Confessional. Are you saved through the confessional? Are you saved because you got splattered with holy water? No, you're saved because you believe in and on Jesus Christ and you believe him with your heart. Amen. Father, open up some people's eyes with your word, not with me, not with what our church says, but with your word, Father. For if your word speaks and they don't listen, then what can man say to anybody who would not listen? And I pray to your God, because I know, Father, that your word has power to raise dead people back to life. People who can't hear now can hear. People who couldn't see now can see. Lame people now can walk. And those who were lost and dumb sheep out in the wilderness, Father, you've brought back into the fold because of the power of your word. And I pray to your God tonight that the gospel would go forth from this place, the good tidings of great joy which are for all people. We go forth from this place tonight, proving and showing, Father, what is that true gospel. That is salvation by grace through faith alone. Father, teach us good things tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And as I said earlier, Nicodemus was a religious man, probably a moral man. He's not, he's not of the evil crowd that was always trying to, to destroy Jesus, but he hears things that as a Jewish elder, as a man knowing the Bible, he's never heard these things before. That's why Jesus said, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? How can you read the word of God and know not? Well, partly because God hid them. He hid them in the things that he said. We know now that we can look through the Old Testament, we can see Jesus literally on every page. In every symbol, in every story that's there, we see a picture of Christ, we see a picture of grace. And contrary to what some people believe, I can see the, the gospel, literally, all through the Old Testament. And you got to have your eyes open to that, but you can see it there. Uh, how, was, how was Noah saved? Was he saved by works or was he saved by grace? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How was Adam saved? What compelled God to clothe Adam and Eve? It was grace. It was his love for them. It wasn't what they, that they undid what they did or that they went out and did better things than the worst things they did. God loved them and he clothed them himself. And that's a picture of righteousness. Uh, Moses, was he, was he taken up into heaven? We know he's in heaven. Was Moses taken up into heaven because he did good works or because of grace? It was because of grace. David, because of grace. Abel, his sacrifice was received because of grace and because of faith, his faith. And so it's, it was no different in Abel's day. It was no different in David's day. No different in Moses or Abraham or Isaac's day than it is today. God still accepts those who come to him believing what he said and he gave us the illustration that goes all the way back to the book of numbers of what he meant by that he said as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so turn to numbers 21 one of the things that as i was reading uh d's catholic bible that she brought uh here dropped it off or she sent it with john john had it laying on my desk when i came in and um, D reminded me of some things that were in there Sunday. But as I was going through that again yesterday, something just really stood out to me in reading how the Catholic priests, how they view the mass and how they tried to explain what they were doing. And, and I, today I came in and I watched several um, mass services on YouTube. And of course I had, you know, the... The Catechism of the Catholic Church, I had that there, and I had uh, this, this book that Dee brought me, which was a Catholic Bible, but it had an explanation of the Mass and what everything meant in it, and what they were doing, and why they were doing it, and so on. And what stood out to me was the idea that as you came to church, you were sinners. Now, the object of you coming to church was so that you can have forgiveness of your sins. That's why you were there. That's why they compelled you to be there. Because in their eyes, 
you cannot be saved literally outside the Catholic Church. And they mean outside the four walls of that church. You can only be saved in this spot, in this church right here. And they mean it. And so what interests me was, and what got me was, here these people come in, they're sinners. Here comes the priest and the altar boys. They come out on stage. They're sinners. And yet they say that we need to purify ourselves so that we can receive God's grace. But that's not when God administers his grace. It's not needed when we purify ourselves. Because number one, we can't. What did Jesus say about sick people? They who are whole need not a physician, but they who are sick. So we come to the great physician, and yet, according to them, the great physician tells us, heal yourself first, then come see me. Well, what's left to do if we've healed ourselves, if we've purified ourselves, what's left to do? But that's what they tell everybody. You must purify yourselves so that you can receive this from God. But that's not where God found us. Paul said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Numbers 21. And I want you to take a look at what the Israelites were doing that compelled God to save them. In Numbers 21, verse 5. Remember, they had been living on a diet of manna. And they murmured against God over that. In verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses. Is that how you approach God? No. Okay. But they did. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. In other words, we don't like what God's sending down from heaven. Well, that was obvious. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among them, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. The fact that the Bible has to mention that they were fiery serpents tells us that they were not ordinary, under-the-rock, desert snakes. These were devils. These were spirits. If you don't believe in such things, I'm sorry, but they're all through the Bible. These were fiery serpents, and they bit those people. The analogy of it, you go back to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent's poison is in his mouth. When the serpent spake his words to Eve, it poisoned her thinking. And it caused her to want to look upon the tree now in a different way. And that's what she did. And she ate of the tree, disobeying what God said. God promised that in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And yet God is still going to have grace on Adam and Eve. He's still going to forgive them. When God sent the serpents out here, is it because the serpents got out of hand and were killing more than what God wanted? And that's why God said, oh, I better figure something out here. No, he had it planned all along. God was going to reveal grace to these people and to us before this event ever happened. But God knew it would happen. And it makes you wonder why God called the Jews to begin with. Because apparently no one's harder to convince than a Jew. God spent 39 books of the Bible trying to convince Jews how right he was. And to this day, they don't believe it. But if he can talk a Jew into it, he can talk any of us into it. Amen. And that's what he did. And so verse seven, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Who did they go to? Moses. And who is he, John? The mediator. They've already learned uh, we don't want to go to God. It'd be Moses, it'd be better if you told God this. Trust us. Okay? But they did. They went to Moses. And who is Moses in this story? Who's, he's the mediator. So he's Christ, right? He's not Mary or Miriam. He's not the mother church. He's not an angel. He's a, he is a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the mediator. They went to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord. What did they do? They confessed their sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. It works, doesn't it? And against thee, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people.
That's what a mediator is doing right now for us. Aren't you glad for the mediator? And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Set it upon a pole in it, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And again, that's not how you cure snake bites. They used to tell you. Who remembers getting a snake bite kit back in the old days? What, what did they have in them, Roy? Yeah. Suction cup to suck the poison out. They tell you not to do that anymore. I guess. Don't suck that poison out. No, get it out of there. Um, but anyway, that's not how you cure snake bites. But these are not ordinary snakes. This is sin we're dealing with. This is a spiritual issue. So we have spiritual snakes and we have a spiritual solution. An operation of the mind called faith. An operation of the heart called faith. I believe what God said. And those who really believe what God said don't have a problem doing what God said do. Because after all, I mean, it may have been hard for them to stand up after having been bit by a serpent. But how hard is it to look at something? It's not hard at all. So once Moses made the fiery serpent, made it out of brass. So brass represents fire in the Bible. You might want to write that down if you're studying the Bible and you see something of brass. I mean, think of the color of brass. Okay, it matches. So brass would represent fire in many cases in the Bible. So he made a brazen serpent, set it upon a pole. Um, we use the symbol of the caduceus, um, which is a serpent on a pole. The ambulance has it on the side. EMTs carry it. Doctors have it, used to have it outside doctors' buildings and so on. But set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass. Everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So now let me ask this question. Do we need, do we still need the serpent of brass? Do we still need it? No. no. In fact, what eventually happened to this same serpent of brass that Moses made? Yes, sir. It got destroyed. Uh, I don't have that in my notes. But what happened was, look up the word Nehushtan. N-E-H-A-S, no, yeah, yeah. N-E-H-U-S-H-T-A-N, Nehushtan. It comes from the Hebrew word Nakash, which is the word for serpent. And what they had done was in the days of, I think it's Jeroboam, they took Nehushtan, the serpent, the brazen serpent that Moses made, they set it up and they were burning incense to it. In other words, when you burn incense to something, you're sending prayers to it. So think about now when you walk into, if you've ever been in a Catholic church, Matthew, have you ever been in a Catholic church? Okay. Um, my choir teacher took us to one down in Cape Girardeau and we sang in it and J.R. and Callie, I can remember just being awed at this building. It was an old church from a river community from years ago and it had all the statues in it and it had gold leaf everywhere. Everything was made of gold in there. And they had candles lit and we got to go up in the choir loft up by the organ pipes and we got to sing. And I was just, I was 17 and I was just in awe of this. And it's a trap. It is a big eye candy, look at us trap is what it is. And so the Catholic church, they, uh, they excuse the use of what they call images or icons, that's what they say. They don't call them statues, they call them icons. They excuse the use of statues and images in the church and they say, 
Now, we know that's not Jesus, but it's an aid to help us visualize the presence of Jesus in our midst. Okay, so why do you need it? If you say that Jesus is already in our midst, why do you need the statue? Because what can the statue do? Nothing. We're better off calling them dummies. What do they have at stores? Dummies. We used to call them dummies. They don't say anything. They don't hear anything. They don't see anything. But you're supposed to go in and bow down before them. And what I made mention of in this week's Watchman was you cannot have a Catholic mass ceremony without a statue of the crucified Christ on the cross. You can't do it. It's not allowed. They have to offer that Eucharist, that piece of bread in front of that idol in violation of Acts chapter 15, in direct violation of not just Acts 15, but Ezekiel chapter 20. Thou shalt make unto thee any graven images. God said, don't make any of them. And they insist on it. So here we have the image of the serpent on a pole. And that's why I asked that question. Do we still need the brazen serpent now? No. And I'm glad. I think it was Hezekiah destroyed it, broke it in pieces and got rid of it because he knew that it was wrong what they were doing, burning incense to it. And now that we have Jesus... We don't even need Moses. Well, we need Moses to take us, to show us the law, to show us how guilty we are. But we need Jesus to save us from it. Amen. But Christ has now been lifted up. That was, that was the whole point of it. Christ, even though he's not Satan, Colossians tells us that he made a show of his enemies openly on the cross. So upon him is cast all the sins and curses of the world rep represented by the serpent. Because the serpent has power over death. And so Christ bears that image on himself, crucifies it, and now it has no more power against us. Why? Because we believe. We believe that. So that's what he was saying. As Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. So, and the Bible's clear about this. When you have done the second, you take away the first. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Hebrews chapter 10. So if we were still looking at a brazen serpent on a pole, we wouldn't need Jesus. But now that we have Jesus, we definitely don't need the brazen serpent on a pole anymore. Amen. So, now, is that all it takes is belief. This is, yes, this is the doctrine. John 3, 16. Um, back in the day when people went to football games. You remember the old days? Back when people went to football games, in stadiums? Remember those days? Some guy would hold up the sign that says John 3, 16. He didn't have to write it out because he knew most Americans knew that verse. They learned it in church sometime in their life. They knew the one verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And therein is contained the essence and the core of the gospel. It provides God a means of satisfying the justice of the law and also allowing God to extend mercy to those who have broken his law because the justice of the law is satisfied. A, a, a sacrifice has been made. And this, this also gets me. In understanding how Catholics are to view the Mass, they say that the bread and the wine that's brought out for the mass represents the people in the church. And that they first offer themselves as a sacrifice to God, that God may accept us and our sacrifice 
so that will cause God to give us his sacrifice. But does God tell us to sacrifice first before he sacrifices for us? No, we are sinners. We can't, there's nothing. God only accepts a perfect sacrifice anyway. And unless you believe the church can wash your sins away with holy water, there's no way for you to sit in that pew and purify yourself anyway, which is what they believe they're doing. That literally, and I read this word for word, that priest believes that when he has that altar boy, the altar boy will come, and I watched this today, he will pour water over these four fingers here, just these four. And he has this little towel he dries them on. Now, but, but first, the priest to the water goes. He makes the cross. That purifies the water. Now, wait a minute. I thought the priest was unclean. The priest blesses the water. So now the water is holy. Now the water washes the priest. Now he's. It doesn't make sense, does it? No, it doesn't. That's what they believe. He's waved his hand like this in front of the water. Karate chopped it. Now it's pure water. Now it washes his fingers clean. Now he can touch the bread. And now he can magically transform the bread, which is the people. They can, and they believe that because he's purified with the water on his fingertips, he's washed clean his whole body and purified him from all sins. And the fact that he kissed the altar. The fact that he kissed altar means that he kissed Jesus. And because he kissed Jesus, he has God's graces right here, which he then must go like this to you. So you can receive now God's graces. But there's nothing there. It's a superstitious, make-believe religion. Even to those of us who are religious, it's a make-believe religion. But they, the Catholic Church, and I would say Christianity is guilty of this almost daily, and we have to watch for it. We have to watch for elevating self-righteousness over Christ's righteousness. But the Catholic Church is guilty of emphasizing good works of Catholic people that they may deserve the graces that are given to them. But if it's grace, by its nature, it's undeserved. And since you can't do anything to deserve it, much less purify and cleanse yourself. What then is the purpose of receiving the Eucharist if you have already cleansed yourself? And God has accepted you as a sacrifice. Now you can accept him as a sacrifice. It doesn't make sense. The more I read it, the less it makes sense. But he's establishing the doctrine of grace through belief. John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. So how do we get it? We get it by believing. Acts chapter 4, verse 4. How be it many of them which heard the word believed? What did we read in John 20, verse 31? These are written. Why did John write his gospel? So that people would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you might have life through his name. So in Acts 4, John and the other disciples, Peter and James, are preaching. And many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, you have 3,000 being saved. day after that, uh, in Acts chapter 3, I don't remember how many, but now in Acts chapter 4, you got 5 more thousand being saved. Simply from doing what? Hearing. Hearing and believing. So when Peter tells them, they said, what must, we redo, what must we do to be saved? Peter says, repent and believe the gospel. If you believe God, what are you going to do? Repent. That's the thing. That's the point. You can always show what a person believes by what they do. That's the doctrine of 
grace plus works or works grace without works is dead acts 5 14 and and believers were the more added to the lord multitudes both of men and women who was added to the lord believers acts 8 12 but when they believed philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of god and the name of jesus christ they were baptized both men and women now turn to Acts chapter 8. You should have known we were going there. This is about Philip and his ministry. When Philip preached, they believed. And when they believed, they received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost because they believed and they received the Spirit, not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith. They received the Spirit, not because they had purified themselves to receive it, but because God, Christ and the Holy Ghost had purified them with his blood and the water of the remission of sins. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, this is the story of the, the eunuch. And this eunuch is from Ethiopia. Now, what is a Jew doing in Ethiopia? Well, we know that Solomon had a visit from the queen of Sheba, who was the queen of Ethiopia. There is a story that... Solomon married her and fathered a child through her. I don't know how story, true the story is, but we do know that, uh, I think it was back in the 80s or early 90s, um, they rescued a bunch of Ethiopian Jews and brought them to Jerusalem, brought them to Israel to live now because if you're a Jew, you're an automatic citizen of the nation of Israel. They brought them up there, but there was a quite a large group of Ethiopian Jews living in Ethiopia at the time. And this eunuch is one of them. And he's on his way to Jerusalem to worship. Why? Because God said in the law three times a year, every Jewish male has to come to Jerusalem at Pentecost at, or excuse me, at Passover at Pentecost and then Feast of Tabernacles. They had to come to Jerusalem to worship. And that's what he's doing. And we know he's reading Isaiah chapter 53 verse. And if you look in Acts chapter 8 verse 32, the place of the scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So open he not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Now that again, that's from the Old Testament. And what we're going to find out, and this is what I like. Where's the New Testament? It's there in the form of Philip and the Holy Ghost who's with him. The Holy Ghost is the one who said, Philip, get up and go and you'll meet this guy. So Philip did, not knowing really what was going on, but he's going to be led by the Spirit. So we know the Spirit's there with him. The New Testament is in Philip's heart. Because this Jew who was reading the Old Testament does not know who that is. That, it, that was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. Because he said, verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip, I said, and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. See, the thing is, we know the New Testament. We know the mysteries. We have, we have the other half of the story. We have the rest of the puzzle and we put it all together. And we understand now when we read Isaiah 53 that it's not talking about Isaiah. It's not talking about somebody else in Old Testament times. It's talking about somebody that this eunuch did not know yet. And so it took the preacher, Philip, to open up as Christ does, he opens the book to us and opens it to our understanding. So Philip is a representation of the New Testament here because he knows it and he has it in his heart. And he's going to tell, I know who that is. Boy, I'm glad. Aren't you glad you met me? Imagine how I just happened to be here. Okay. And so verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And I was sharing, uh, Tim Barron's had taught me this. There used to be a, a parody newspaper or magazine that went out years ago called the Wittenberg Doors. 
And it basically, it was Christianity making fun of Christianity. There's a lot to make fun of. And it was based upon Martin Luther's, he nailed his 96 thesis to the Wittenberg doors. And in some cases, they were using parody to show you what was wrong with Christianity. And there was a bunch of things wrong with how people portray Christianity. So what it did was it mocked stupid people who were trying to pretend they were Christians. But that's where he found out that Mother Teresa, under the guise of soothing the heads of poor feverish Indian children who were dying, she was actually sprinkling holy water and baptizing them. So that when they died, Matthew, they didn't have to go straight to hell. They could go to purgatory for a while and hope that somebody prayed them out. Now, those Indian children didn't know Jesus. They didn't understand that. They had 330 million gods. Did they believe in Jesus Christ and were baptized? No, they were just baptized. And that's my thing with rituals. That anybody can perform a ritual. Anybody can. I can hold my hands like this. I got a picture that's, it was kind of funny because you have these three priests standing over the communion table going like this and it looks like they're all warming their hands. <laughs> Maybe God didn't want me to record that. I don't know because I said it today. <laughs> I can stand here all night and do this. Are you going to get anything out of it? No. It takes belief in the word. So he says, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Philip's like, I don't know. Do you believe? And Philip said, if thou believest with all that heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And verse 37 is the verse taken out by the New American Standard, the NIV revised the New English version. Um, all the modern translations have taken out verse 37. So when you jam 36 and 38 together, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Poof, he's baptized. But Philip said, you have to believe. If you don't believe, it's no use baptizing you. But not according to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church accepts you, if you come and participate in the ritual, according to them, that's all you got. All you have to do is do what we tell you to do. And you can go out and live whatever kind of life you want to after that. You just come in, pay us the money. We'll forgive the sins. That's a nice, nice little racket going on. You go out and sin all you want to, Roy. And you bring in some money. And you pay us. And we'll give you an indulgence for those sins and you don't have to worry about them. I mean, Catholic mafia bosses are burning in hell right now who were wearing a crucifix when they were shot down in Chicago. All of them. All of them. Because all of them were Roman Catholic. And I guarantee you they had a family who was a priest member, member who was a member of the priesthood and forgave all the family's sins because they gave large sums of money to the Catholic Church. That's how it's done. But it's a belief. Acts chapter 10, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Belief. While Peter yet spake these words, he's at Cornelius' house, the first Gentile family. The Holy Ghost fell on them, fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why did they get that gift? Was it because they had purified themselves? Was it because they borrowed from Paul to pay Peter? Why was it? They believed. Acts chapter 13. 
Verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through who? This man, Jesus Christ. Not through the Holy Mother Church. No church anywhere has the power to forgive your sins. By him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, the law had no provision in it to justify sinners, except through the animal sacrifices that were held every year, and they had to be done every year. But now that Christ has entered into the holy places once, made without hands, once and for all, Forgiveness is given to all those who believe. And how many times did he have to die to get it? One time only. That's another thing that, I mean, it bothers me. What, one of the things I watched today was a daily mass in, um, where was it? I can't remember where it was, but it was an old man, this priest, this old guy. And he could, he had to get around on a cane and I'm not trying to make fun of the guy, but the fact of it is he just went through the rituals. They do it every single day at this particular church. Mass is held every day. What happens to something we do every day? Have you ever pulled into the church, John, and said, how did I get here? It happens to me all the time. Now that Caleb's driving, how did we make it? But you, something you do every day, like driving to work, you daydream all the time. Right? And they do that math. That old man has done that mass 10,000 times 10,000 in his lifetime. And it's just, he's kissed that altar. He's done this. He's done this. He said these words. To where he don't even, you could tell there was nothing in it. Nothing but dead men's bones. Yeah, Roy went. He liked the wine part. How many Roman priests are drunks? You better believe it. Um, but it's nothing but ritualism. They just go through the motions, wave the hands, Eat this, you're fine for a week. Take this once a day, come back, see you next week. And that's all it is. One guy in, I watched Denver, Colorado, the Archdiocese of Denver, Colorado. This, he's a younger priest, but he's got a radio disc jockey voice. And I mean, he was like, welcome to the Holy Eucharist Catholic Church. It sounded just like that. And his sermon was like three minutes. And the mass... He had done that so often, he, he was actually ahead of the choir boy. He had done it so, he was doing it so fast, boom, 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 hurry up and get it over with. And I'm going, we're supposed to re pause and remember Jesus in this. Where's the remembrance? Okay? But it's just nothing but liturgical madness to them. They don't believe, 90% of those guys don't even believe what they're doing. You cannot be justified by the law of Moses. You cannot be. There's no provision for it. There's no forgiveness of sins. It's only by grace and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I got more, but I'm just going to repeat the same thing. I couldn't tell you how many times the word belief was in the Bible. Belief, believe, trust, faith, all those. And it's. That's what the gospel is. It is us believing what God said. And you, and you receive it.